Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Addiction and the Three Principles. Uh, today, we are joined by Christine Heath. And uh, this is a little bit different uh, format than we normally do because we're just taking questions today, pretty much. This will be an interesting, uh, interesting session here. Looking forward to it quite a bit. Uh, I know Harry set this up, and there's there's a couple of questions we have to kind of get going, but we'd like definitely like uh, participation from everybody here today. So just keep in mind, I only have you muted to keep down on background noise. So if at any time you have a question or comment, just uh, please feel free to unmute yourself, or go ahead and click on the participants tab and the raise hand feature, and then we'll get you in. We would definitely want this to be uh, as interactive as possible because that's where that that good juice energy, what do you call that area, the, the juice or whatever, <laughs> that's where that all comes from. So with, uh, with no more from me right now, I'll hand it over to Harry and we'll get started. Hi guys. Uh, yeah, when I was in LA, it came to me that I, I would like to know more what was on the mind of people who are experiencing addiction. And because uh, as a teacher, I can't imagine a more important point. If we don't know what's on people's mind, we just talk about the principles and feeling good and all that type of stuff. But it, we're, not, we're not, as an educator, we're not connecting on deep enough level. And uh, when with, I asked Christine to come on to answer the questions and she submitted three or four questions herself from her clients. She's extremely experienced. But what I like about Christine is, is she's a natural. She's herself. And because she's herself, she has mentored me to be myself. And I, and I really want to thank you for that, Christine, because it was hard for me to be in the three principles world because it's so structured in some senses. And, and when I see yourself just being who you are, I said, well, if Christine can be who she is, I can be who I am. <laughs> <laughs> and, and even, though, even though that sounds interesting, it was so relevant to my growth. And uh, so per, probably in that area, Christine has been my, my greatest mentor. And uh, I really want to thank you for that, for just being yourself. It's funny, isn't it? It's, it was more than enough. Now, um, I, I wanted to, uh, to introduce Christine in a different way. We, we all know her as very seasoned and experienced, but she, she has written a book, whoops, <laughs> called the... Oh, we write the first way. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so anyway, The Secret of Love. And uh, uh, I, I slowly got into this book, and last night I was reading it, Christine. I uh, got up in... The, and I want to read something. Christine has a section on addiction. Uh, it's such a strange topic in the secret of love that she should have a chapter on addiction. And it's beautiful. Beautiful. I, I would recommend buying this book just for that chapter, even though the other parts will, will be relevant to certain people's minds. And I want to read something from it. And then we're going to go. It's going to lead into a question, Christine. And then we'll, we'll, we'll go from there. Now, today's class, we're going to, we're going to be hoping that you'll ask Christine and, and, and have group discussion around questions. So anything that pops into your mind that you, that you think is relevant, please pop the question. Christine would love to answer. Now, I'm going to read this from Christine's book. Whether using alcohol, drugs, gambling, sex, pornography, or any other harmful behavior, the addiction absorbs the mind so that nothing else can enter a person's consciousness. All of these trap distractions only work for a, for a while. And like any technique, the person using them has to be, has to up the ante. That is why people have multiple affairs why they increase the dangerous exploration of sexual activity, why they have multiple addictions, and why their drug 
and alcohol use increases over time. One more paragraph, excuse me. An addiction is not good for your relationship because your attention is on your addiction rather than on relating to the people you love. The negative consequences of poor judgment can cause financial problems, affairs, physical problems, and more. The illusion of thought can trick you, and you won't see that you are creating these problems. That is what people refer to as denial. Now, here comes my question. Uh, one more thing. People will look outside themselves for relief from their stress when they, they don't realize that stress is the product of their state of mind. And I realized, Christine, when I was reading that, it kind of opened up. I don't really understand at a certain level what a state of mind is. Roger used to talk a tremendous amount about state of mind. Could you, that's the first question I have. What is a state of mind and how does it relate to stress? Well, a state of mind is kind of a combination of your level of understanding of thought, what you're thinking about, um, how much you know you're thinking. And it's, to me, human beings are, you're always in some kind of state of mind, that you're functioning in a certain place, okay? So I keep it simple, and, I, and for me, I'm either in an insecure state of mind or I'm in a secure state of mind, and I go back and forth all day long. So the more, um, the more negative thinking I do, the more insecure thinking I do, the more real that all looks, that creates a whole uh, experience in me. So it's not only just in my thinking, but it's in how I feel, how my body works, how I'm sleeping. There's all kinds of things that are produced out of the state of mind that we're thinking in. So it's just like the, the it's hard to put it into words now that you're making me do this, but it's really kind of the, the space that we're living in. What, what was interesting just before it came on, because I, it, when I hear state of mind, I'm always thinking, well, my low state. But Linda Pettit just was looking at the palm trees and she said that Sid said uh, that heaven is a state of mind. And, uh, and it made me realize that the, that state of mind is not only about bad feelings, but also about uh, beautiful spiritual feelings. Right. Like when I first learned the, about the principles, that was one of the things that really hit me is that I didn't know. I really, I mean, I was a therapist and I didn't know that there was as, as much growth in health in, in living in a state of mental well-being and living in deeper states of mental well-being as there was in, in levels of insecurity and stress. Like I could see that people would get stressed and sometimes you were a little bit stressed and sometimes you were a lot stressed and sometimes we had to hospitalize people and sometimes people were just like living in chronic stress. And, um, but I never occurred to me, like to me, health was just the place you got to. And then that was it. I didn't know there was an equal amount of, um, of levels of understanding that would take you deeper into those beautiful feelings. So that was, to me, it's, it's like state of mind kind of de de describes your level of functioning, your level of understanding, your level of consciousness. And we go in and out all the time. So when people refer it as moods, that's another way to talk about it. It's the mood you're in. It's a, it's a way of describing a state of being. But that's, that's the truth about, like, um, like when you're in a really beautiful state of mind, everything in your life looks different. Everything feels different. And then when you're in a really insecure state of mind, you have a whole other reality that you create that's not so, not so comfortable. And actually sometimes people, when they get into a really beautiful feeling, sometimes after they just are learning the principles, they drop into this deeper state of consciousness and it's like, wow and then they start thinking about it and they get freaked out or they try to hold on to it you know they try to keep it and i'm so for me understanding that it's just this kind of flow of energy that we kind of go through our state of mind is like not something to judge myself with but just to see that, that that's what's happening and when
when we get into lower levels of, of consciousness and and we don't know that it's just our state of mind that's causing the stress we try to fix it we try to fix it in whatever's we've seen in life that looked like it might help or it looked like it helped somebody else So any comments or statements about what Christine has talked about? Well, I guess that's good for that one. Okay, I have a few questions here. These are, here's, these are Christine's questions, some of them which she submitted. Um, um, why do I feel better after meeting with someone or listen to Sid, but then lose that feeling and use again. Do you want me to reread it or did you get it? I got it. Okay. So these questions were questions that I, um, I had for myself, you know, that's for sure. And, uh, and, and also that I get a lot with the people that I work with. So that I was trying to think about when I put the question out, like what, what sitting on the other side of me, what frequently do people ask me? So for, for me, it's, it's kind of like um, most people who are addicted to things don't, don't have an insight that they have to want to change like they come in and they start getting a good feeling and they hear that this new understanding helps people but then a new understanding also becomes part of the outside world and so they come in and they listen because they think they're going to get something from that session but they're not really um going deep enough to see that like they have to be open to get their own insight that they want to listen for their own understanding. So a lot of times people that have addictions think that there's something, you know, in therapy or in treatment or in, um, in Sid Banks's stuff that's going to fix them. But the only thing that fixes us is our own listening. So a lot of times what I'll do is just talk to them again about how to listen, but not for a high, not for a new high, a therapy high principles high because you can you can hang around with people that are in a really nice feeling and you'll feel better kind of but like you know how tuning forks work you know where one tuning fork is 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 vibrating and then the other tuning fork it's on the same frequency but in order to maintain that alignment for yourself you have to see that you are that and it's just a matter of letting that come through you and and wanting to feel better without doing anything. Like it's just so programmed in people that you gotta do something to feel better. One of the, uh, one of the stories that came to my mind when you were talking, um, you know I do not so much now, but still a, a fair amount of indigenous ceremony. And people go into the sweat lodge, Christine, and they experience the spirit. Or, or God or the great spirit and they change they come out of the sweat lodge and they look 20 years younger they've had a, a all a, an incredible connection to the spirit but what they do traditionally or, or often is that they start talking about the same problems that they had before they stepped into the sweat lodge and within 20 minutes, that feeling that made them look 20 years younger has disappeared. And they're back in the old world that they went into. And I've often queried my mind of, of what, what it is that they experienced in the sweat lodge, or in our case, the three principles that and and when when people would talk about that, the city would just say you just didn't hear deep enough, or you're still it's still too intellectual. And in the indigenous ceremony, 
they didn't, they associated it with spirit because that's their nature. They're much more uh, uh, open to that. But they, they didn't see that they were part of that that came from inside them. They, they, they saw it as, as more an outside experience. And, uh, now that's, that's, that's it because people, a lot of times because the principles is so helpful to people that the word gets out that if you go there, she'll change your life or he'll change your life. But if it's on, on me to change somebody else, they're going to be out of luck because if I could do that, the world would be a different place and I'd be very wealthy and living on the beach and we wouldn't need any kind of help for people. But that, so it, that's the deal is that it, that's why techniques in general get started because somebody does something and they start feeling better because they stop thinking about their problems or they stop you know focusing on the negative and and they feel better that innate health in them kicks kicks in and they start feeling better and so people say oh it's because of this you know it's kind of like like buddha would meditate right and so somewhere along the line somebody saw him sitting with his legs crossed and his fingers together and said oh that's how you got to meditate so then it, it it, it's like we look at the form of what people are doing or where it's coming from instead of looking within. And it's really tricky because like for me, like I had a big insight about this just recently because I would get frustrated with people. They'd come in and they'd get better and then they'd kind of plateau and they think like, hey, my life is better than that ever was. But they didn't have any like personal attachment to that. It was about them coming to see me, and in their mind, I was fixing them. And I thought, oh my gosh, no wonder, like, I'm just another drug. It's a better drug than the one they were on, for sure, but it's it's still not going to hold. It's not going to help them. And that, that kind of ownership, like, look, if you want your life to get better, you have to listen to the tapes and be open and, you know, do the things that I'm pointing you in the direction of. Otherwise, you know, you're going to be stuck with yourself. So being able to, to see that for me more clearly, like I just, because, you know, it's like when people are really in low places, if you hang out with them for an hour or a day or whatever, their level of consciousness will rise. But like, like sweat lodge, if they connect the sweat lodge with that feeling, they won't maintain it. If they go deep enough to see like, oh, I am that feeling, then they'll change their life, their life will change. But that's why we get tricked. That's why the world gets tricked, but, right? Because like I was just having, a, we were having a discussion about EMDR in treatment centers. And um, uh, one of the uh, treatment center wanted to advertise that they did EMDR because it was, you know, evidence-based. And I said, well, I don't, I wouldn't do that. Well, I didn't quite say it, but, I was like, what? You would do what? That's totally outside in. And, um, and, and there's a way that we kind of want to still see that there's some value in that, you know, that, that it's not as simple as just seeing that you are okay, that you are what you're looking for. It's so simple, yet we, we get so caught up in trying to understand how to feel better instead of realizing that it's just right there. It's like, like the simplicity of it is still hard for people to see. That's really true because in, in my journey, my attachment was to Sid. And as long as I associated what I had experienced to him, it was exactly the opposite of his teaching because his teaching was it's inside me, I, for me. And, uh, and that attachment to the form, even though it was a beautiful form, uh, held me back for 40 years, Christine. And it, it, it took a lot to wrestle that away from my consciousness. But of course, when it did go away, it left, it, it was like it, it, clean, it was like cleaning me out. I was stuck and I, need, or I had a bubble and someone had to pierce it. And, uh, and so I, I think in the three principle world, we're seeing that there is a bit of attachment to the form and not to the essence of Sid's teaching. 
because we have to remember it that's he's the teacher he's the, and he, he he would he always never wanted to take credit for it he would always say that's coming from you and in fact in fact Terry, that's the first thing he said to me I, after i met him he called me up one day and he said you know would you like me to be your teacher i was like yes <laughs> big I'm, question yeah. i'm like quivering on the other side of the phone like oh okay and he said he said two things to me he said first of all he said do you have any dearie do you have any questions and i said well I just have one question he said you know i hear people talking about a spiritual reality and what is that and he laughed and he said oh dearie nobody on the face of the earth knows what that is so don't try to figure it out i was like oh great and then he said to me he said just be you and that's the most powerful thing that he ever said to me just be you and that's what we all have to remember is that what that we know that we have within us all of the answers that we need to live a good life but we're just not very good at listening yeah so you know it's um that idea that it's a little tricky isn't it because you know that if somebody's at a higher level of consciousness than you they're seeing something you're not like to me that was the thing that helped me right but if i made my feeling be about their understanding now i'm attached to them right so it's seeing that yeah there might be people that in whatever moment they're in they're seeing something deep for the next minute they might not be there right but their state of mind might change and they're not there and that was the thing i think that was great about sid is that he was a very ordinary guy you know he'd get mad at all of us and he he'd have these moments and people would say oh my gosh how can he be an enlightened guy if he's getting mad but that's the point of it is that we're all just human beings seeing whatever we're seeing and and in the next second we can be back to that that good feeling again but that's the part of us being human is that we all have our own our own experience so i often think that that was part of the whole deal was for us not to make him be like something different than other people I mean that's kind of the whole if you've ever listened to his um the the, the DVD on um his experience like he was he was such an ordinary guy it's unbelievable you know he had all kinds of problems in his past and I mean he was a mess really if you if you sit and listen to what what he's talking about and then he just wanted to have a nicer relationship with his wife and that's kind of what um happened to him is that he just dropped into such a deep state of consciousness but he knew that it wasn't about him and he knew that the world being at the level of consciousness was that that they wanted and were going to be looking for him to be the person to do it for him. and so he was wise enough to stay out of that position out of that role or take it on because it's too much for anybody to take on nobody's like that it, it when she's two things about just to to bring a little more graphic to the picture uh he always said it was a crap shoot it was just a fluke of luck that he became enlightened nothing he had done before really led to it and the first public talk that he did christine which you wouldn't know about was called gathering of the ways and he was he didn't know how he was supposed to dress he didn't know. so he dressed in all this white cotton that all the india from india were wearing and 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 he wore that and he had stepped on a nail and he was had been uh, was full of uh, medicine and stuff like that and he came out in front of i guess 3 or 4000 hippies and talked and that was the last time i ever saw him wear a white cotton outfit <laughs> because he didn't know what he was supposed to look like and so he had to so that was his experiment as you know Sid was actually quite conservative scottish guy who liked to wear a tie and jacket and stuff and so uh, i always laughed at that but that's what he you know that's where he started from he was on a, a new journey of of being enlightened
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, but, but that's the thing. He would say, he would say, look, I'm just a regular guy learning how to live in this state of mind. You know, that's, that's what he was, was doing. And that's what everybody needs to do is like, as we claim it and we pay attention to ourselves and we're like living in the best place we can. And when we're not, we fix it. You know, it's like, that's just, that's just life in the big city. It's, um, you're going to do stuff and say stuff, at least if you're engaged with life. That's one of the reasons I wanted to write that book, because to me, the living of the principles is about interactions with people. Like that to me is the way that um, I learn the most about myself is how I am with others. You know, and I think that as, as we're living and trying to live in the best place we can be, the things that are, that come up against uh, that we come up against usually are about how we interact with each other. I mean, that's why there's a whole marriage and family therapy association, you know, that it's, it, it's like if people got along well, we wouldn't need to do that. So it's that, that kind of seeing how to change your life from within and let it happen as opposed to having it being done to you or trying to control it either way. It's like it has to do with the outside world now even if it's in a positive thing. Like I remember the first, I had one SID tape when I first learned the principles. I listened to that sucker every night because I had nothing else. There was no books then. There was, you know, we had no internet. We had no way of even, we didn't even use long distance calling. You know, so there was no way to get anything else. So after about oh, two or three months of listening to this, I went into a, one of my groups and I started talking and I said, A, and I was like, oh my God, I'm listening to this tape too much. It's like I'm starting to talk like Sid, right? A Canadian, and, a Canadian. Right, right, right. And so, you know, it's, um, you, you get too into the outside thing, like that's got the answer for you. No, it doesn't have the answer for you. It's just pointing you in the right direction. And then the answer comes to you as you settle into it. It's like really settling into that feeling. But that's kind of the, to me, that's what we all get caught up in. It's, you know, two things. One is information application. Like, tell me what to do so I can fix myself. Or you're going to do it to me. You're going to, you're going to be the one to fix me. And so that's why like, people come in and they want to talk about their problems, right? Like this is happening in my life. My wife doesn't like me and this is happening and that's happening. And it seems like if we could fix those problems, we'd feel better. But th there's no end to those problems because they're not coming from your outside world. They're coming from you. So I think that was the other question, right, that I gave you. It's like, why, does, why, why doesn't anybody see that I'm okay? You know, why do people think I have a problem? Uh, that happens all the time. Like, th like, drinking isn't a problem for me. I don't know why my wife thinks it's a problem. I don't know why my boss thinks this is a problem. Blah, you know, it's like... There's this wonderment, really. It's truly wonder. In, in, in the old days, I used to think like, oh, they're, so, they're just such liars. They obviously know this is a problem. They just don't want to quit. They're just trying to manipulate. And they're, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then as I, as I learned more about this, I could see that really, there's, you just don't see it. Like you have no clue that, that how you are and how you're operating in your life is having this effect on other people. Now, in reality, the effect it's having is caused, being caused by their thinking about it, right? But, you know, my husband always says that if you walk by somebody and they kick you, and they go, oh, sorry, huh? And the next time you walk by, they kick you again, and they go, oh, sorry, huh? Yeah, the next time you walk by, if you don't move so that you don't get kicked, that's on you. You know, and so we don't, Sometimes, you know, people say, oh, I'm sorry I did that, but we don't make, we don't see the big picture of how we impact people. So it's confusing to people, like, why, are, why do people think this is a problem? I can stop anytime I want to. This is like, I'm in control of this. And that, to me, the, the thing that really um, affects people is when they connect up their crappy feelings with whatever 
they're doing in their life that's not healthy. Like if they don't connect that up in their mind, they don't like this a guy I just started um, working with a couple actually about a year and a half ago. He had really bad PTSD from the war. He'd been um, in um, uh, Iraq in the early days and came back and started using crystal meth and was drinking a lot and was a mess, got divorced, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, he had severe PTSD and he was um, he had quit all the drugs, but he was still drinking in a way that was really not very helpful in, with his relationship. And um, uh, maybe for the first while, he, I mean, he got better, he got better, but he'd still have these you know, crazy situations that would come up. And then that's when it hit me that he was coming for me to fix him. And then when he saw that, he started to focus more on living in a better feeling. And he started to notice that he was in a bad feeling. And then the last time it happened, he, after he, he got into a kind of a, he would kind of get violent a little bit, punch the walls and stuff like that when he'd get angry. And um, he, he kind of woke up because he could feel the difference in the feeling. And when he felt that, he said, oh, I saw that when I drink, this bad feeling happens. And I don't want that anymore. And that he's been absolutely free and clear ever since. Now, so simple, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is so simple. But when you're looking at it from the other side, it's not that simple. It's like what, what, who, ah, ah, what's going on? And it's just like settling down to really focus and see that that feeling that you're in. That's like whether it's a good feeling or a bad feeling, that's your best friend. Because that's the only way you can tell where you're coming from, like what state of mind you're coming from. Because when I'm in a good when I'm in an insecure state of mind, I still think that everything I say is great. It's not, but you know, in that moment it seems right, it seems like a good thing to say, and then later on I'm like, oh man, why did I say that? Maybe to summarize this, why do I feel better after meeting someone or listening to Sid, but then lose the feeling and use again? This isn't exactly what you said, but what came to me, Christine, is when you have that good feeling, you're sharing that good feeling with other people. As you mentioned, the interrelationship with other people. And you're sharing that beautiful feeling. And then, of course, you're growing in that feeling because the moment you share, you grow. But at a certain point, you start to think back about yourself, and that thinking takes you back into that old world that you're living in, and you lose the feeling of it. And, 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 and then the journey seems to be that you have to go and re uncover that same answer, except a little bit deeper. So I often say to people, you have to share a beautiful feeling with other people. And that will help you tremendously instead of sharing uh, a, a, a lousy feeling or an ugly feeling. And so in answer to that question, I think what happens is people just get, they just haven't quite learned enough, which of course is all of us, about how how that positive feeling can grow. Mm -hmm. And so we start to think again about our own problems. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you do that, I think that's the best check I ever have in my life, Christine, is as soon as I start thinking about my own problems, I know I'm lost. <laughs> you know, that's a, that's a great signal. Oh, that I don't want to spend too much time there because I know where that's going to go to. And, uh, and, and, and then intuitively, it's over. I don't know if that made sense, but that's what came to me with what you were talking about. And, uh, you know, self-monitoring. Anyone have a question? Not all at once. Hold back. <laughs> I have more questions. Go ahead. Yeah, but that is... Uh 
with a lot of the people that I work with, that's kind of the big question. You know, they, it's like they sit down with me and they get this great feeling and then they go home and the feeling isn't there anymore. You know, they, they ask me like, what did you do? Did, you know, and it's, it's not about the person you're talking to as much as how open you were to that feeling at the time. When you get in front of somebody like, you know, like when people come to meet with you, Christine, they're expecting to have a better feeling, right? That's kind of why they're there. So naturally they're going to be more open to those better feelings. Whereas, you know, People in, in addiction have spent many, many years in not so comfortable feelings and kind of became, I don't want to say became comfortable with them, but just became used to them. You know, it's just kind of what you expected. You, you know, you're going to wake up in the morning and you're going to have a crappy day again until you can get high or get drunk or go shopping or whatever the thing is you, you do. You know, and then you, you get in front of somebody who, you know, maybe has this kind of, it's not so much like a direct promise, but it's just you get you get this idea that they're going to make you feel better. Right. And then when you get that better feeling, you associate it with the other person. That's right. That's right. And that's yeah. you know, that's where it's not lasting. It just it it doesn't take long to go back to the old crappy feelings <laughs> when you think that that's all you're capable of creating for yourself. But the fact of the matter is, every feeling that we ever experience is self-created. There is no other way that it works. Now, that, that being said, being more open to it will allow you to have, a, but it'll allow you to experience those, those more comfortable feelings more often. And I don't really like to call them good and bad because they all have their place. You know, there's, there's something to, you know, going through a period of maybe some depression or, or something like that, because it, it helps to bring perspective. Uh, I don't know about that, but no. I think that, that no, I mean, I, I think that when you come out of it, you have perspective, but like, that's kind of like, I mean, to me anyway, I, I, any experience we have, you can get an insight. If you get an insight from that, that's great. But I think that um, what happens is, is that when we go through life, we're going to have the experience of whatever we see to have at, at, at the moment. And just seeing that that's kind of the, the innocence that we all go through. But I get a little hesitant because there's a lot of it. See, I think in our, in our world, we've had a lot of attachment to suffering. You know, like there's um, kind of like there's no pain, no gain. And, and, and so we're, we don't necessarily get anything from the depression, but what we get it from is coming out of it. So that's what that you, you want to see that that's how we learn. That's how we change is coming out of it, but not from it. Otherwise, it's like we're trying to figure out why we're depressed so we can feel better. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, like, I, and I yeah, I wasn't yeah, I wasn't trying to say that the depression itself is the greatest thing. It is it's but it's that you no, but people it's all part of the, the experience of life though. You know, at yeah, some yeah, point yeah. we're all going to experience depression, we're going to experience anxiety, you know, but it's it's in the realization that it is self created that's going to actually give that or uh, provide that uh, that better experience afterward, I believe. Well, what I, what I think is important and what, what you're saying, because I think this is really important for people, is like I used to do uh, therapy, and I was we do this what's called anger work, right? Where people would come in and they'd be upset about something, and then they'd like try to express their anger, try to like deal with it, try to share it. And it always seemed to help them. Like at the end of the session, they'd feel better than the beginning. Okay, and so I thought, oh, that's because they did this thing, right? But it was really because they created this really bad feeling and then they stopped doing that, right? It was like they stopped doing the anger work and then they could compare that. So that's where, that, that's where we learn from is seeing that that's, that kind of bad space that we're in was a result of my thinking at the time that 
the way I was looking at life, the insecurity I was feeling, all that. But the reason I'm better now isn't because I was depressed. It was because I had an insight and saw that I didn't have to live there. So for me, that's that makes it a, a bigger, a deeper thing. You know that we can see that it's we don't have to suffer because I'll tell you the world thinks that they have to solve their problems in order to feel better. Like everybody, that's why people want to get on the phone and talk to each other about oh, and then he did this, and then he did that, and this happened, and that happened. We're always like talking about our uh, our problems because we know that somehow, sometime when when somebody listened to us, we felt better. And so we're trying to feel better by sharing this bad experience and hoping that the other person will make us feel better. Like somehow they'll do something. But you know, over time, it's like and you don't ever get any relief from it. And it's kind of a process of um, trying to fix what's wrong. So I'm just a little bit like, I, I, having been depressed for 30 years of my life, I I, I don't really, I, if I had learned about the principles when I was 16, I would have had a different life. It would have been it would have been a lot different. Now, am I sad about being depressed for 30 years? No, it gives me lots of compassion and understanding for people. I had to really learn, I mean, to me, it was like, life said, okay, you gotta teach this, Chris, so you are in a really bad state of mind, you need to change fast. And that allowed me to change. So it provides me with an understanding. Like I've got friends that never have been depressed in their life. They're just like happy people and they've been happy their whole life. And to me, that was an oddity. They were a little bit weird, you know, because they weren't taking life seriously or they weren't engaging in uh, the political realities of life. And there was all these things that I didn't understand about that because I hadn't lived there. I didn't understand that. But so I don't feel bad about the fact I was depressed for 30 years, but man, if I could have learned this before that, it would have been great. I guess it wasn't 30 years I was depressed, it was more like 20. So, so Mary, what do you think about what, what the two have been saying about bad feelings? Um, can you hear me? Okay. Well, it's hard, I'm a little... I did see George a residential years ago and I did get really good feeling, but I do sense that when I'm not with that person, that person is giving me like George is giving me the good feeling. Um, I also saw Richard Carlson. He was giving me the good feeling. It's hard to, even now I feel like I'm always searching, you know, getting another book, even though it's on three principles but I'm not really feeling it. So it's hard sometimes. <laughs> that's, that's what it, that's all I have to say, I guess. Good, very relevant. So, um, yeah. Well, I'll tell you, Mary, that for me, it's like when that's happened to me, what, what I had to do is realize that I was trying to figure out how to get that feeling instead of seeing that you are that feeling. Like, you just want to be happy instead of thinking that somebody's got to do something to you. So sometimes, like, sometimes people have to stop reading other people's stuff. They have to stop doing that and really go out into life and see if you can get into a good feeling. Like, one of the things I did one time and I'm not saying this is a good technique, but what I did is I like, oh, I got, I was doing this long, a year long training project down in Florida and I went down there and my teacher looked at me and he said, you're a mess. He said, I don't know what's going on in your life, but you better go clean it up. And I was like one of the few people in the, like there's maybe 20 of us in the world using this and teaching this. And I knew if I went back to Minneapolis, people would, because they were already watching me, like, what is this stuff this heap is into? And what's and I knew if I went back, people would diss the principles. It wasn't called that then, but they would diss this work instead of me. Like they would use that as a confirmation. So I had to stay at down there for a week. And I cried the whole time. So it's like, oh, I'm such a disaster. Oh, 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 oh. I'm what am I gonna do? <laughs> oh, no. oh, poor Christine. Oh, oh, oh. So embarrassed. 
embarrassed. I was so, my ego was <laughs> crushed. And I just couldn't believe it. So, and I remember taking off to go home. And I called Joe Bailey and his wife and said, come pick me up. And uh, I went through the clouds. You know when you go through those low-hanging clouds and it goes from cloudy to this beautiful blue? It's like we went, we, that happened, I was like, Okay, I know that that feeling is in me. I've got to find it. I have to find it. And so I went home and Joe picked me up and I'm licking my wounds and telling him how out to lunch I am and how I've lost the feeling and woe is me. And, and then um, my the man I was engaged to came over and he was um, drunk. And I looked at it and I thought, oh, this might be one of those things I need to clean up. And, and so I told him, I said, look, I can't be in a relationship with you and keep a good feeling. It's, this is not about you. It's not about you. It's me. I just can't do it. And right now, I need to find my, my mental well-being. I, got, I need to find my feeling. I just, that's the most important thing to me. And so I broke up with him. And the next six weeks, because they cut me off. They said, no more, no more mentoring. No more teaching, nothing. You're on your own, girl. It was, in those days, it was a harsh, you know, throw you into the ocean and see if you can swim. And, but it was the best thing that ever happened to me because I went around studying good feelings with people. Like I just went, and that's all I was noticing, like the, the grocery clerk at the little convenience store by my office, the, um, the children playing with their, their families in the playground, just like soaking it up, like just looking for it and wanting to, to understand more of that. And then all of a sudden, it was like, oh, there it is again. And it just, I got up one day and it, all that was gone. And I started laughing at myself and I thought, oh my gosh, I can't believe this drama you just put yourself into. And, and so of course then I, I call up my my man friend, right? Because now I think I'm good, right? And uh, he goes, oh, I'm engaged. And I was like, what? And it was, to me, it was like life just came in and said, this guy is a major distraction for you. And you need to not have him in your life. And he got married like three months later and sobered up for this woman. And then I had to realize like, oh my gosh, I was a for him either it wasn't all about him you know and, and that's just like you just want to like you got to trust that you are that good feeling so it's just a matter of really letting it come through but to, what I did is I just like that became my mission my mission was to find my happiness again because I love that feeling I mean I hadn't been happy for most of my life and so when I had that feeling, it was great, but then I got in my head about it and I thought it was kind of hot shit, you know, and that, you know, I should know it and blah, blah, blah. But really knowing it at that level was like boot camp. So I'd say, go for it, Mary. You know, like, don't go for it in the books or in other people, but find it in yourself because I'm not different from you. Like Harry said, you know, it's like, if there seems to be yourself, anybody can. In fact, my mother told me, my mother told me this. She said, after I uh, started to, have, uh, after I was in this for a couple of years, she said, honey, you tell your clients that if this can work for you, it can work for anybody. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, I want you to notice, you see that feeling just popped into Mary? Like that's inside of you. That was just, that just came out of you. That's it. That's as simple as it is. It's just that we get, we're so attached to our intellect, we want to figure it out. And as soon as you try to figure it out, it's gone. Like for me, that was, that was really great because I didn't think I was very smart anyway. And so when I realized I didn't have to like be smart and think about it, I was like, yeah, this is for me. So the dumber you are in a sense, the more you like, the more you kind of accept not knowing and being okay with that, that's your freedom. That's where life becomes fresh and new all the time. And don't compare. And don't compare, Mary. That's not the journey. It, 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 it seems that the, that's your ego 
telling you you don't know enough. It's not the, the feeling that she's alluding to is happiness and contentment within yourself, which means you don't compare. You're doing fine unless you compare. And that, that thing that we, we play, that's dangerous, very, very dangerous. That's, that's a killer. And you, you know, in three principles, you walk around with all these different levels of consciousness and the trick is, who cares? Who cares? You just you are going to attract the love that you need in your life by being yourself. And anything else is going to be a disaster. That's the magic of that's why in my uh, the name of our book is the secret of love, unlocking the mystery. Because people are looking for love, right? And unleashing the magic. Yeah, that's unlock the mystery, unleash the magic. Yeah, sorry, you're correct. Yeah. But but that's kind of like the more you trust that, and the more you go with that. Have we got time to write my another story? Sure, we got okay. time for anything. Okay, great. Is it a good story? Is it a good one? Okay. It's a, it's a good one. It's, it's about listening for your feeling and how your feelings kind of guide you. Um, last Wednesday, I got home from work and my, the gate to my house was wide open. And I drove in and, and I have three big gorgeous dogs, but there were only two there. So the first thing that happens is my heart sinks into my stomach, right? Like, oh my gosh, I'm missing a dog. So I go and I'm calling him. I think maybe he's in the house. I've got lots of thoughts about where he might be. He's not there. My husband comes out. He doesn't know where he is. And so I start calling him, calling him. And he usually runs away into this pasture we have with about eight cows in it, and a lot of wild pigs and a lot of muddy things. And so I'm walking down the road, calling him, calling him. He doesn't come. He doesn't come. And he's never never separate from the other dog, his sister. And, and then my husband comes with the truck and picks me up and we kind of go holo holo around the area. And something came in my head and said, check the pasture. So I said, honey, let's go back up and drive around the pasture. And we have the pasture is about 10 acres and it's, it's divided into three parts. So we did the first section and then we did the second session and then section and then my thinking came in and said, oh, stop being a baby. You're obviously, you can't see the dog anywhere here. He's not here. You're looking in the wrong place. This is stupid. So I said, honey, let's go down and around in the town. So we start driving around and the farther we get away from the pasture, the more anxious I get. Now I'm starting to feel like, oh my gosh, something's wrong, something's wrong. And, and then I started thinking like he's, he got gutted by a pig and he fell over the cliff. And, you know, I had, but each time those thoughts came in, I didn't like, react to it. Like the thought came in, I was just like, let it go. Yeah, that could happen. Yeah, that could happen. Go back to listening. And so I told my husband, I said, we got to go back to the pastor. So he drives back. And I said, go get my boot. I got to go get my boots and my rain jacket. And then we're going down to the far pasture. So we drive down there. And as we're going across the pasture, there's, um, like all the cows are there and there's no dog. And I said, keep going over in that corner. I just knew where he should drive, right? So I get out of the truck and we're down by the gate. I, I walk down to the gate, which is the farthest end. And on the other side of the gate, there's weeds that are over my head. You can't see through them. You can't, you can't see anything. And I didn't hear anything. I was just listening for him to cry or something. I call his name, nothing. And then the dogs on the hill started barking, and I hear this little, and I was like, then I, my thinking comes in again, like, oh, your mind is making that up. You're not really hearing that. And then I hear it again. So I, I said, okay, I, I'm going. And my husband goes, don't go in there. That's where the pigs are. That's where the mud is. Don't go in there. He's like, no, my dog is in here. I got to go find her. So I go, and I keep, like, listening for the crying, and I come to the edge of this thing I thought it was the edge of the ravine and I was going to look over and see a dog that was you know had a broken hip or had fallen or something 
I look over the edge and here's my dog. About time you got here. Well, she'd fallen, she'd fallen into a cave uh, that was on the ground level. You know, it's probably an old lava, lava tube. And she, he had fallen down in there and there was no way he was getting up. There was just no way. Now, if I hadn't been listening to my wisdom, I would never and there was like just something that came over me that I was able to really listen for that. Now, I still had my anxious feelings, right? I still had all these other feelings that came in, but I was using them as a way to direct myself towards listening to my wisdom, to that deeper wisdom. And long story short, we were able to get him out. My husband has got, you know, congestive heart failure and I had to lift him up a 14 foot ladder because he'd fallen 14 feet down. And, and when we got him up, of course, it was uh, a miracle that we, the three of us lived. But um, it, honestly, if you could see, I have a picture of where this cave was, you would know that there was no way I would ever know that he was there because it was so far away from everything. And so, like, as we go through life, that's what you want to, like, listen for, that you've got this direction inside of you. And I think that that's what happens sometimes is we start to think that, um, like, we know that we could feel better. Like, we know that. And then we start thinking about what to do about it. You know, like, oh, I could, you know, marry this person, or I could live here, or I could do this, or I could, you know, there's something outside of me that needs to make me happy rather than really trusting that you know what you need to do to live in that feeling but that knowing that we could be better that's the help in us right it's just that we don't see how thought works to take us down the road the wrong direction so like when i was going like for me when i get anxious i know i'm going the wrong direction again whether it's about finding my dog or about what to do in my business or what to do in my life it's like, that's not the right direction. So I turn around and go the other way. And I just keep listening. So the more you listen and you're listening for that feeling, it'll guide you as you go through life. And you'll see in yourself, like, oh, no, like for me, I was like, geez, no wonder I get depressed. Look at what I'm thinking about all the time. And I couldn't believe how negative and judgmental and um, problem oriented I was. It was just like, I cracked me up for about three days. What are you shaking your head about, Mary? You just went like that. Oh, you're muted. Yeah. Uh, no, I feel a little emotional, but. <laughs> I, I don't really, I don't have anything to say, really. Okay. Okay, so can I help you a little bit with this? I, I don't know, really. Well, is it okay if I try? Yes. <laughs> okay, great. Because, see, what's happening right now is like your intellect is kind of doing battle with this. Like, whatever that thinking is you have about yourself, that somehow you're different or you're flawed or you're something wrong with you, that you can't get this, that thinking just came in and it look real to you, okay? That's just, that's just like your, our thought systems are designed to perpetuate themselves. So I always, I call that thinking it, the, the pimp that lives in my head, okay? Because he, he keeps telling me this stuff and I listen to it. When I listen to it, it seems real. But that's not real about you. That's just, that's just your thought. That's the thought that's holding you back. Yeah. So there's nothing different about you than me. Yeah. Okay. So when that thought comes in, just like let it go and say, I want to see something deeper than that. Because that's not true. It never has been true. But the more we think about something, the more real it seems. Yeah. Okay. And, and so it seems like this is God speaking. Don't forget, you're different. You've tried <laughs> all these things and nothing's worked. Yeah. Oh, that's right. I forgot about <laughs> when you're just having a conversation with yourself. Yeah, I get yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. So just like when that thought comes in, let it go. What if that's not true? 
What if it's not true? Because we can think all kinds of, like I used to think I was tall and I'm five foot four and a half. <laughs> really, because my sisters and my mother were all like five foot and five one. So they used to say, Chris, you're the tall one, go get this. Chris, you're tall. And I honestly <laughs> thought I was tall until I was a freshman in college. And we had, we had pictures in the dorm and I, they said the short one's down in front. I went to the back. And all the big <laughs> basketball players were looking down at me and they go, Chris, what are you doing back here? And I said, oh, they said the short one's down in front. They go, right, get in the front. <laughs> and it's like, I went, oh my gosh, I'm not tall. It was a shocking moment, right? Yeah. So there's nothing wrong with you. Yeah. You can find this feeling. You are it. So you can't lose it. You can't get it. It's you. Just let it come through. Yeah. Because it's like the more you see that that thinking, that I just find that happens. It's like when you start listening and you're, 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 so you start coming up a little bit, then your old thinking kicks in. Like, danger, danger. She's starting to think that she's not bad. So bad things could happen to her. <laughs> it's like that's just how we program it. That's just how we program our thinking. There's no truth in that. Mm -hmm. It's just like, that's just what you've been thinking for years. So when you start feeling, when you get out of your normal a little bit, that thinking kicks in and then you start paying attention to that and you come back down again. So when that comes in, just like, oh, remember, that's not you. And the feeling that creates is the truth of it. That's the truth and that's your mind's tricking you. And so I'm, a, I'm a recovering damaged goods person myself. <laughs> and, and, and that's just the, it's just a trick of the mind. Yeah. It was the best understanding that we could have at the time growing up that there was something wrong with us based on our age, the way we looked at life, the state of mind we were in, all that stuff. We just made stuff up. And what we made up is that there must be something wrong with me, which is not true like nobody is is different nobody yeah. is damaged so thank you thank you mm -hmm. I, i'd just like to add one more little thing what the story of her finding her dog is the reward it's what i call the mystical nature of the principles because life becomes mystical rather than logical mm -hmm. and when when you step into that world or you would might call it intuition. You step into that world, it, it's so wonderful because it's, it makes life truthful mm -hmm. rather than made up. And my husband was with me. He has his own story about it because he could feel it. Like he could feel it in me, right? So he didn't like say a word. He's like, okay, whatever, you know, like, and, and so he tells us his own story about what it was like to watch me know and not know at the same time. Beautiful. That's beautifully said, Christine. Beautiful. I love that. That's the magic of the principles. And, and to me, that, that happens. I and mean, this is an ordinary day thing, you know, an ordinary life thing. But I knew, I knew that if that wasn't, that wasn't happening with me when I found him, I was blown away by that myself because I thought, man, there's no way I would have found this dog. And I love my dog. He's my big boy. It really was the secret of love. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely beautiful. Anybody else have any uh, comments or questions? Uh, there's a comment on the um, chat by um, I think Carmel, and that that is really a, a really important thing. That trust that you are more than the thought you experience. Like that, that that's like you know um, my mother had Alzheimer's and um, when she was, um, it was about this time of year, it was Mother's Day and we brought her a Dairy Queen, for those of you that are Americans might not know what it is, but it's this chain of ice cream places and this Dairy Queen ice cream cake that she just loved. 
So we had all the people from the nursing home coming in and sharing the cake with her. And everybody would come in and say how much they loved her and what a wonderful person she was. And so my sister says to her, she says, now, mind you, she's got Alzheimer's. She's like kind of half there most of the time. And she said to her, she said, Mama, you're so special. Everybody thinks you're so special. And my sister, my mom put her fork down and looked at my sister and she said, special? I'm not special. Unique maybe, but not special. You know, and that's the thing. When you see that you are, what you are is not what you think you are. That is what makes us special is our own thinking about ourselves, right? We're all the same thing. We're all the same energy of life. As we're just experiencing it in different, in different forms with different thoughts. So there's nobody better than anybody else. There's nobody worse than anybody else. Like that whole thinking that when there's something wrong with you, that it's a kind of a way of being special, but you're not. You're just a regular person. And I, that's the other thing that Sid told me that first day. He said, just be ordinary. Just be an ordinary person. Just be a regular person. And that frees you up from needing to be better or needing to be worse or thinking that. Well, this seems a good place, Christine, to uh, wind, wind it up. What, what's interesting from besides a beautiful talk and sharing, was we only had we only went to one que one real question that Christine had many others as well, and it 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 shows that a question is very valuable, uh, very very valuable. On and maybe Christine, you'll come on again and we'll go into a couple of more of the questions and so on. I, I, I love doing this. I I much rather do questions and things like that than talks. I think that it's like. It, I don't have to prepare, and um, I, uh, I I love doing it. So anything that I can do to help you guys, I'd be more than honored to do. We'll talk about that, and and because we Christine has, we have three three or four questions, and I and what I'm going to ask of people who listen to this show, if a question comes into their mind, please either uh, Facebook or Messenger, Greg or myself. And uh, and then we'll put it on the list of questions that we we want to answer for 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 people. Uh, I I feel there's just not enough questions asked in three P. More oh let's be positive and acceptance. And even seeing Greg and Christine talk the way they talk that's very useful for both for you know that's that's we're not always going to agree on everything you know it's you know we're human beings and we have levels of understanding sometimes you know one's this and the other we're sharing we're sharing a feeling and if we don't judge the feeling it you could see what happened where it went and the love that Christine and everybody, all of us shared, and that's uh, you know that's what I love about this show is the love that's shared by everybody, and uh, we call it group discussion or we call it whatever, but it's it is a feeling of love. It's a nice word, Christine. Yeah, and that's that's just a, that's a whole other conversation about how people make love be something that's a thing. That people make love? <laughs> well, that, but, uh, uh, that, that when well, now we're getting them, interesting. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> ah, ah, that, that's a good show, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it's like just in general that people think love comes from the outside like it's a thing. Like you took your love away from me or you don't love me and... It's like this love is this thing out here rather than it's just you. I, I'm just going to say one thing. Uh, in Christine's book, what struck me, uh, just to put a little, is she talked about pornography and gambling. I've never seen pornography ever addressed uh, as a topic. 
and so on. And she's talking about it from a very wise perspective. But it, I, I cannot, your book does touch in areas that a lot of people are keeping away from. And uh, that's, I, I give credit to you for that. I mean, it, it's important that, that we don't have little black holes in certain places and, and so on. And uh, um, I found that interesting uh, and rewarding. Uh, well, so. that, that's, a, that's another question, actually. That, that part of the book came out from, from clients really saying, okay, well, Chris, but what about the really hard stuff? What about, you know, this kind of stuff? These are really big deals. These are problems, you know, like this is real. So that's kind of why we did that. Yeah. Well, it, it was appreciated. Good. Yeah. That's yeah. really for me to hear that. I just, you know, it's, I, I know it's helped, it, it's helped several people that I, I mean, not several, but many of my clients so far. And so as long as it helps people, it's great. You know, for me, I can see like, oh man, I would do this differently and do that differently. And I doubt that I'll ever write another book, but um, if I did, I, I, I could see how I'd do it differently. But that's just my thinking about it, right? So it doesn't matter to me as long as somebody gets helped. Yeah, and what Christine is talking about, it, as an author that recently released the book as well, when someone does give me a compliment, it goes to the bank. It really feels fantastic, to be honest. And, uh, um, you know, that's, that's a sharing that, that I think isn't done enough, where you say thank you, or that's appreciated for what you've done. And I should tell you that too, because your book, um, my my staff that do our do a lot of the addiction uh, work, uh, they loved it. Oh, yeah, that, yeah. That. They, uh, they they thought it was uh, very helpful that we have our clients get it, and it's nice that people can want, look, read it online if they don't have money, they can get online and read it for free. It's very simple, you know. Beautiful. Thank you for that, Harry. Thank you very much for saying that. And, and well, it's the spiritual feeling that's being shared. And, but I really appreciate you saying that. I mean, it really touches me uh, to, for you to say that, you know, especially in, in programs and so on, because we share to, to, to help. And I want to emphasize, Mary, the book that I wrote, didn't come from very intellect. It it just came through me. Uh, I couldn't have written a book like that. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh, yes, thank you. And Christine's book is yeah. There we go. So self promotion time is over, guys. <laughs> it was a treat today. I really enjoyed this. This was really. This was a different type of feeling, Christine, than we've had on our show, and that's beautiful. Would you agree, great? Definitely. Yeah, it was, it was a much, I don't know, it was like a much deeper space created, I think, I feel. Well, I personally, wonderful. I think that that's, that, again, it's about, it's about how we are with each other. That's where the goods are in the principle. Because you can make the principles be as intellectual as anything else. You know, and and that's so when like that's why I don't do that well at doing talks on things because I'm I'm much better just at interactions between people and um, that's that's kind of um, we can all relate to that because we're all the same right it's just seeing that we're all the same like people are always amazed at that like oh wow you get stressed it's like uh, yeah. I just don't, I don't take it seriously much anymore. So thank you so much for doing this. I'd love to do it. Anytime you want to do it, let me know. Even we'll talk, we'll talk and, and see where, where we can fit. And, you know, the, this type of format seems to fit with, with, with you really, really well. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we've got lots of questions. But please send questions. Honestly, you don't have to list it on the message thing, but send it to us. And we'll put it on the list. And I, I personally cannot grow without your questions. I can't. I need to know what you think. And is, is there a way someone could contact? Do you have my information somewhere where someone could contact me if they want to ask a personal question? Oh, absolutely. We'll put it what? on. 
Why don't you go ahead and say it now, and we'll, we'll also put it on the YouTube channel with the recording. But go ahead and say it now so it's on the recording. Well, my email address is christinejheath at gmail.com. So there's a J in there, christinejheath at gmail.com. Absolutely. Yeah. You would be very wise. I'm telling you, Christine is, Christine is genuine and unique, to use your word. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that's uh, the great thing about all of us. You know, it's like we're all bring something to us. Yeah, and, and some people are just bigger free spirits, and Christine is one of them. So, beautiful to see. So I guess the adulation is over, Greg. And <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. Wonderful session. And thank you, Christine, as well. Beautiful. Yeah, thanks, Christine. See you, see you guys in a couple of weeks here. Enjoy the rest yeah. of your day. In two weeks, yeah. Oh, just, and uh, Christine, we're doing uh, something also unique in two weeks. I've got Mark Howard to do a four minute video as an intro into a, a group discussion topic of what, of how do we know whether it's an ego thought or a spiritual thought. And oh. so we, we got a little intro from him that's a little bit different as well. So. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, he's, he's my idol, so that, that'll be great. <laughs> well, we'll see, we'll see. <laughs> Well, it's always, it's always fun trying up new things. You never know. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. So love, guys. Aloha. All right. Aloha. Aloha.